In the studio now, we've been joined by the country's chief minister, Dr. David Moini Nasenge. The chief minister is here to talk about governance policies, one and a half years of President Bill's second term, implementation of the unity agreement uh, between government and the APC, among other developments. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Good morning, CM. Good morning. Good morning. CM, you started with you were sometimes doing on the spot checks, um, <clears throat> keeping your social media platforms updated, doing uh, QA and a with, how's the office going? Good, I'm loving it, it's fantastic. I think it's uh, gotten me closer to the people and I think the people feel closer to the government. The way I think about my role is to really bring the government to the people in the vision of the leadership of what the president says, actualizing that and working with colleagues um, to make sure we can do and get stuff done. Um, I'm enjoying it. So far, you, you've had your highs and lows on social media. There are those who say the ones perhaps very serious, not too strict chief minister, has become sort of diluted, for lack of a better way to put it, so to speak, I more think, playful. I think it's maybe a lack of a better way, it's just a different way, it's not better or worse. I think um, if you look at the history of how I've engaged with citizens, I've always used social media as a way to get connected to people. Um, whether I was in university or at IBM, it was to get to the young people, to be innovators. Now, if you check, now people are happy to say I'm an innovator. 2018, 2017, they weren't innovators. The only people who were innovators were people who were in Innovate Salon. They were people who we chatted with, uh, but until it became mainstream. Um, I think people misunderstand the use of social media social media the way we use it it's where most people are it's how you get to understand the grievances of the people it's how you engage and respond to what citizens want it can be misused it's often very misused and when you have poor literacy lack of information lack of ability to verify certain things lots of disinformation then it can be dangerous as we've seen across the world but that doesn't mean um, uh, the government, that doesn't mean leaders um, remove themselves from it. Because if you're not where there is this information, you can't give the right information <coughs> to people. Um, I like to think about it that I'm more accessible to Sierra Leoneans at, across all age, across all classes. You don't need to wear a suit and tie to come to my office to talk to me. If you talk to me and say, there's an electricity problem in Ogufam, and I see it. I will call the people. This is, this is an actual thing that happened this morning on my way. Somebody sends me a message on, on social media, Ogufam, we have an electricity problem. I send that to the leadership of the Ministry of, of, of Energy. That's responsive, authentic, direct form of leadership with the people. Part of the playfulness on social media has been the tantrums between you and your boss's wife, the first lady. I wouldn't say that. I, I, there hasn't been any direct confrontation between me and her at all. Um, so I think it's uh, people read into what doesn't exist. The, you can never look at any of her posts or my posts and say there's a direct confrontation. How so when radical inclusion, for example, has been your signature? And part of the posts she made on social media were also sort of connecting the dots to radical inclusion. People would obviously read meanings into things. That's people reading meanings. I don't read meanings into... It's a radical inclusion is a global movement. And you it's don't also exclude the back and forth with who takes credit for the MCC compact. No, I think, again, this is where people misunderstand what happens. So let me just clarify. The president, the day before we travel, say something, thanking everybody, highlighting the VP. Um, 
The next day, we land. The same day, I go to a CSO engagement. I'm sitting next to the US ambassador, and we speak. And as an example of mentioning a difficult dialogue, because this was in the dialogue conversation about um, uh, post-election tripartite, we say, I can mention that conversation. So people take one and A and think it's all numbers, but one is a number and A is an alphabet. People read falsely into things being somehow that there's a trend or a pattern, but I think it's all people's imagination. Um, let me take you back. Let me, let me drag you a bit from the tantrums that um, Fabian just mentioned. But I do again, think it's a wrong mischaracterization, by but, the way. But, but again, um, the word has a meaning. But again, um, many will say, as a very young man, you've brought in a unique taste in the country's politics. Senge, that many know before his time, seemed not a politician. Um, just one fine scientist, but you've, had, you've earned yourself this kind of repetition within the shortest of time. How do you, how do you go about doing the same, Senge? I don't think I've changed, by the way. I'm still the same David Moynina Senge that was there. The Senge that, that now talks politics. It's, I, so what we consider talking politics is just good governance. It's just engaging with the people. It's Politics is policy. Politics is bringing politics and ideas to the people. I'm a politician because I am in politics and I'm in government, but the people think politics is bad. Politics isn't bad. Politics is how we take our ideas, our visions, our aspirations, our hopes, us as individuals and the people, and get to do them through policy. I love that because I love getting things done and I love having an impact on people's lives. So yes, I love politics as we define it. I hate bad politics. <laughs> Nobody, nobody's saying, oh, Senge is corrupt, oh, Senge is doing nepotism, oh, Senge is doing this. Nobody ever says that. People say Senge likes delivery, Senge does what his boss does, Senge loves radical inclusion, Senge says we will deliver. That's not a bad thing. If that's what politics is, then I love it. Um, I think about the age and young. I am not young. I am youthful. I am, the, the median age in Sierra Leone is 19. My first daughter, my niece, uh, my, uh, my first biological daughter is eight, but Khadija is going to college. She's 18, just turned 18. She's young, she's a young person. In an age where the me in a country where the median age is 19, we we infantilize youthfulness. If you're 35, 36, 37, you're CEO in some place, you're you're leading, you have children. You are not a small bubble or a small pekin. I think what has happened historically is that we, because of how our traditions and our systems are set. You guys, all of us, AYV, everybody here is a young person, but you're, you all have your own homes, you all earn, you all take care of children, you take care of your parents. Um, and that's what we need to harness. And what President Bio is saying is that 70% of the population is under 35. If we don't harness their energy, their creativity, their curiosity, their intellect, we miss out in the country, we lose. We want these young people to be farmers, to be leaders, to be mechanics, to be bike riders, not just sitting by the roadside waiting for other people to come and give them handouts until they are 70. Again, um, just as Fabian mentioned, at some point in time you commence the, on the SWAT checks, see particularly so on government, ministries, departments and agencies. Quite recently, the um, same was done for businesses across the country's CBD. This is one area I mean, the, this one area that even quite recently the Parliament of Sierra Leone has picked the same up with regards to the influx of expired products in yeah. the market. Is, was that just a fun fair? Or no. is it an action that will be met with the required I mean, remedies also to speak? It did have the required remedies. I think when I, by the way, what, so let's think about what informs how I do what I do. 
Okay, so if I go to a ministry ye building, I'm probably going to engage with some ministers and just see what's happening. When I went down to Kisi uh, Street, Abacha, um, it's because I'd heard about all these expired products and I wanted to see and I wanted to engage with the women who were there and it's linked to Sewa Grounds. Fantastic building, almost done and I wanted to go and engage them. When I was there, I was there with the technical heads of all of the entities that we related with. Any time we find a, a problem, I will tell them to take action and when I go, they will take action, they will follow up. I was at the government printing the other day because I was following up on something with the Minister of Information. It is not for show. It is a direct way of bringing governance to the people. And again, we've heard the president speak about this before. People also think youthful exuberance is a bad thing. Exuberance is energy. Youthful, in this case, energy that we can go from one side of the road on the rain to the other side of the road, working and talking to people. It's a good thing. Everybody should do it. It's not by age. Your exuberance should not be by whether you're 19, 36, 37, or 65. It's about being out there and serving and interacting with the people. So it's not for show. It's actually for understanding what the people want. It's to follow up on complaints and grievances that we read on social media. And it's for taking action that is effective to drive uh, the priorities of the president, the big five, the government. That's what we as a people say we want, our national development plan. So when I go to do these things, um, we go because we want to see quick impact. Let's talk about the <clears throat> unity agreement. Hmm. Um, so far on its implementation. Uh, what would be your assessment of, of that agreement? I think it's a great thing for Sierra Leone. Everywhere we go, uh, whenever somebody meets with President Bio, they always say, thank you for your leadership in bringing together the agreements for national unity. Thank you for sitting with the opposition. Thank you for how you're doing uh, inclusion in government. And we, we, it's not light, eh? Just over a year ago, there was, uh, the government was um, huddled with non-participation. It was huddled with all of these things. And one year later, many months later, we're in full-fledged delivering uh, when we can see the impact on the state, um, the state effectiveness. We can see how much it affects macroeconomy, the political economy, the, the civic economy. We can see that. So, how is it going? I think it's going very well. Um, in fact, today we have a meeting on the, its implementation um, with some of our with, with, with our donor partners and across government and the opposition. There were eight uh, bullet points, action points. We've either done or nearly completed almost all of them. The most critical was Resolution 3, the Trapatite Agreement, which led to about 85, um, 80, 80 uh, 80 shared agreements, 84 shared but different findings, so four extra. Um, and I think when we see me most of that action is already happening, um, whether the um, PPSRU, the Public Sector Reform Unit, is working with the US partner IFIS to work with ECSL to do my functional management review. So that is happening. The other independent entities, PPRC, the security sector, they're all working actively to do their own reforms. And these are reforms shaped by the 2023 elections. These are reforms shaped by the existence of these institutions, that they need a change, they need a, to, to reform, they need an upgrade and an update. When it comes to the parliamentary actions, there are many things that require constitutional change. These are in line with the constitution that will have to require a reform, a referendum. So we will have a referendum in the country. And I think everybody understands that that will not be politicized because the future of the country relies on the 1991 and 2024 are very different. The referendum is long overdue now. Uh, the uh, uh, constitutional review process itself has taken almost forever. Uh, but we've had promises about that constitutional review process. Beyond just promises, we've had 
national investment into the process by putting so much money. Uh, what's the guarantee to the people that it's not talk as usual, but the constitutional review process would become a reality where people would now go to a referendum and put this to a vote? President Bio is the president of Sierra Leone, and David Senge is the chief minister. We will get it done. Chief Minister, kindly speak to the constitution of um, the, the, the membership of um, the implementation team of the ATG commendations, when in actual fact it seems very clear that it's been over bloated with, say, government ministers and a few members from um, other power staters that are very meaningful to the process. It's a really good point because I think people misunderstand. It's also linked to the uh, CRC. There are processes in government. By the way, government is government for everyone, all parties. When we elect leaders, President Bio is not just president for SLPP or those who voted for him. He's president for everybody, including the opposition leaders. So the opposition shouldn't expect that when it comes to doing national things, that it should be equal, equal. No, it's not a thing. Just as a factor, whether it was SLPP or not, government in government is government. We as citizens, when we participate in civic action, we tell the government we trust you to implement certain things. That's why. What that means is when it comes to things that require cabinet, opposition is not in cabinet. By the way, in our cabinet, we have people who are not SLPP, who are registered from other parties. That tells you how inclusive our government is. Yeah? Namely? The Minister of Sports was the deputy leader for her political party. That's an explicit one. But uh, we don't ask people for their party cards before you become a minister. Which political party? I think it's ADP. Not ABC. Um, and clearly you understand the context of but, the conversation but, is not just so, the uh, well, so my, my point is, no, no, no. When we speak about inclusion and democracy, it's not a, if it's not APC, then that means it's not political but, but, party uh, balance, or that it's not inclusive. That's, but, that's not... Again... We're not saying APC is the only opposition. The opposition includes everybody who ran for the election. But to your point, when we go to cabinet, and cabinet says, we have received this report, now we are setting a committee to implement it, Cabinet says, here are the ministers who are relevant to this, local government, because it includes a lot of that, information, uh, social welfare, um, uh, I lead on that committee, and, and a couple, the AG's department. It's not bloated. It is that the AG's department has to write the laws, Minister of Information has to communicate, social welfare has to think about the elderly, gender has to think about it. So it's not bloated, is it, it's just practical. Is it judicious enough to have just a single member of the APC? When in actual fact... We don't have a single member of the APC, so it's misinformation again. So let's say there are all these government people, there are all the mayors, there's, there's two APC mayors amongst the five mayors that exist. There's the leader of government business, majority leader. There's a minority leader. The minority leader is APC, um, who's there. So it's not there. Then we have all the CSOs. APA includes everybody. I don't know who's, if they're not there, that's, it's, it's a state entity. APA includes everybody. Sludge is there. Bar Association is there. Um, Chadi is there, a CSO. The analogy is this. Say when it comes to matters of voting within the constituents of that body. There's no voting. We don't vote. It's say, that we are we're this, steering committee. This could just be an example. Say when a matter that requires to vote sure. amongst members within that committee comes up, do you think by design will be done democratically? Of, by design of this by body. By design of the committee, we don't vote. And our job is to, as a steering committee, is to work with all those entities for full implementation, which we're committed to. Everywhere you hear President Bill speak, he says we're committed to the full implementation of those recommendations because they are good for the country. They are not good for SLPP, good for APC, good for PMDC, good for uh, NDP. They are good for the country. You're on record to have made a statement that has to do with Resolution 4, which talks on 
um, political prisoners, among other things. Um, what's the current update to say? Um, the people who are leading on that is the Deputy Minister of um, Justice and um, the Freetown Mayor, um, the Secretary General of the APC, who have been going back and forth. The, num the list, and this is something the, the Secretary General of APC and I publicly, in private, everywhere uh, disagree on. The list that I have has 300 and something. The, num the list now that we have in front of us is about 15. Um, and he explains it in different ways. Uh, you have to ask him. But those of those 15, 10 of them are in McKinney, and they are, going tr they are represented by the state. The state represents them. The other ones are over here in, in Padamba Road. Um, we gave them a form that says, fill this form to tell us about the kinds of cases that you're talking about. Uh, they're still not returned the form yet. I think we're going back and forth. The deputy minister was trying to update me yesterday. I didn't get an update from him. But they're, they're meeting. They met yesterday or the day before uh, to figure out. They're asking to add other, um, there's a committee again that involves CSOs and other people. The APC is asking to add other people on there. We probably will say yes because we don't want this to seem like it's a derail of the process. But I think it's just a waste of time, slowing down time uh, instead of getting to work. Because these forms have been given to them from along. It's not whether you have another CSO on the committee to review that would change whether the form arrives or not. Um, We've, been, we've given them every concession. They wanted to get to the prisons. They wanted to sign people. To, we've given them the concessions that we need. And I like in these conversations when they are there, because then if somebody will go and say, oh, it's not true. Come, I'll show you the evidence that it's true. Why do they need to fill the forms if there's an agreement already to say those people who were arrested on what they say is politically motivated why do you need forms? Because the evidence is very different. Uh, m many of them, some of them were arrested, not even linked to the election. Um, if anybody, if... So, if, did the agreement say elections related issues or politically motivated? Because politically motivated does not necessarily mean during elections. Yeah, sure, I'll have to read a specific line, but if you look me by the eye and I say, oh, now because me na SLPP and I think it's politically motivated, uh, anybody can say that. So we don't want it to be like, oh, that's politically motivated when somebody went to destroy somebody's home. So what was the baseline in the agreement? This comes back to post the agreement, how some citizens frowned upon that the government representatives had to go compromise something that some lawyers even questioned, the legality of that to say now you're going into an agreement and you're flouting the justice system, giving people a free pass out of prison. But how did you then define what constitutes politically motivated cases? The first thing I said as head of the government team was we will not do anything that breaks the constitution from that minute to now we have done absolutely nothing that breaks the constitution and you know what the challenge i usually get from some of my friends in the apc oh but you can your government you can you can you can bend some rules and i look at them in the face and i say no i cannot no we cannot break the constitution um and we never will because it is the right and just thing to do. We will be accommodating, we will get extra, the people they want to add, we will add them, we will have you go to the prisons to do other stuff, but if somebody is in prison for committing a crime that we know is a crime and it's a record, you can call it politically motivated or not, but it's a crime. It still does not answer how did you all agree to define what politically motivated cases are. By the way, that's why this committee is set up that includes all these people so that they will take those forms and they will review independently. But so you it's had not already me. agreed to <coughs> that. No, but your point is that so you So you made. agree before coming now to define what politically motivated cases are. It's called dialogue. It's and called it's putting the cart before the horse. No, it's called dialogue and it's called concessions. It's called human relations. It's called putting the interest of the country before 
any individual's interest. It's called having the humility to understand that you and I may not agree. At Was the that point. an oversight by all the educated people who sat in that committee? Absolutely not. Because when we say politically motivated, some may be truly polite. But okay. now you have a stalemate. They're presenting, APC is presenting government with a list. And now you're saying some of those cases, they've not even filled the form to clearly specify the nature of some of those cases. So there's a stalemate. I don't think it's a stalemate because, like I said, those 10, the, the people who are in trial are undergoing trial. They continue their trial. Um, there's no stalemate. And um, the committee will meet and review. But in that, that also includes the say political, um, how do you call it, those people who uh, displaced. And in the in informally they said there's three or there's more okay so give us a list and so we understand whether you left your town because you you are apc or slpp or whether you did something really terrible and you have to go and apologize to the town yourself and we're not saying facilitating i'm not gonna come and build your house for you if you left your house and it's abandoned and trees have grown in it that's not what we're saying but these are general areas that we aligned on and I think if you actually look at the Agreement for National Unity, it is a beautiful document. Uh, from your submission, it seems very clear that um, you, um, when I say you, I mean you and the, the party is not ready to compromise um, as to... No, the it's the opposite. It's compromise that brought us to the table. It's dialogue that got us to that really beautiful document. To get to the Trapatite 84, uh, that required lots and lots and lots of compromise and dialogue. Um, we've been compromising a lot. We've been dialoguing. What I have said is the Constitution remains supreme. I said it on day one. I say it today. Nobody, no state as a government, we cannot be the ones who break the Constitution. That's not that we won't compromise and dialogue on other areas. But if it is to say this is the Constitution, um, break it uh, we can't do that we've had several instances in country where in the constitution seems to have been breached not by um, us sorry and it's sad for those uh, the, leaders who the, do that. the pointers are there this government this this government, government of president julius malabu has not broken the constitution what recently occur, what's occurred in parliament what occurred the, tell me um, the members of parliament were voted in and when they were kicked out just like uh, no that. nobody was voted in and kicked out just like that with, by breaking constitution that didn't happen it happened they went to court the apc MPs. they went to court that the court process is a legitimate constitutional process uh, when we say they were kicked out, is that you kicked them out without going to court. Nobody was kicked out. They went to court. No constitution. None. We haven't. Other people may have in the past. We haven't. The current predicament of the Auditor General and the Deputy? It is an excellent process of going through the constitution and the process. The president could have misused his powers and fired her, but he didn't. He put a tribunal based on the Constitution. The tribunal met, and all the information is public. The interviews, the report, public. It was a public hearing. So nobody went and said, then see, he said, she said. And then what did he do? The tribunal gave a recommendation. He could have also sat there and said, I'm going to act on it. But he didn't. He followed the Constitution and sent it to Parliament. Informations that were, that were shrouded in secrecy on, until 11th hour when they were made public to those who were at the tribunal? That's not true because the tribunal was public. Every part of the tribunal, people could attend. I attended the tribunal, one sitting. It was public. So when people claim that, oh, it was secret, it really means that they weren't following. Because if they were following, and I know that some people went there, and speaking of social media, the day I went to the tribunal and I posted, there was another lady who was there who was trying to argue and misinform, and we went back and forth on social media. Everybody was allowed to go to the tribunal. Anybody, open. And there are people who went. Every document that was in the tribunal was made available. The report is available. So what was shrouded in secrecy? Uh, Chief Minister, what baffles some of the people uh, about this whole thing relating to your party is how the former Auditor General and her team 
had done the work that predicated the GTT report, much of its content came was referenced to the Auditor General's reports in previous years. Your party sang her praises, supported the professionalism of her work. GTT led us to commissions of inquiry. Fast forward to now her investigation into the office of the president, and we see a whole saga of professional misconduct here and there, putting your government under the telescope of hypocrisy. So I, you use two words that are similar but not the same. The party and the government are different. Which, gov which party is in government now? They're different. The party is the SLPP. Which the is the executive arm, the president. No, the SLPP is not the executive arm. The leader of SLPP is the president and the head of the executive arm. Therefore, there's no connection between the presidency and the SLPP. This is not what I'm saying. I'm oh, just saying okay. they, are individual, they are different entities. The party and the party people can celebrate and do whatever it is that they want. As any is other this not the SLPP-led government? It is the SLPP-led government, but they are different. The SLPP as a party is different from the government as a government. And I only wanted to stress that to say I can speak about both of them. The SLPP as an institution, its people can celebrate what it thinks and claims as political victories. or politi It can react to that and it should. The government doesn't focus on political victories. We focus on policies and deliverables and the big five and institutional victories. And the point that you're making is? The point that I'm making is if the government speaks about the GTT, the credibility of the institution, the Auditor General and everybody involved at Auditor Leon, it's an institution, it's a government document that we received. And the government, as well as an institution, has the right to say if somebody had professional misconduct and if somebody violated their institutional function to the executive, we go through the processes, like set a, a so tribunal. What, what That's very intensifies different. the question marks put on the SLPP-led government okay. is that last Friday, mm -hmm. uh, the body of professional accountants issued their release saying, as per their investigation, they found that there was no professional misconduct by Lalate Lopez and her deputy. And this still brings us back to time. Yes. Perhaps let's tie deeper from campaign days when the SLPP, your presidential candidate, was campaigning on the mass corruption in the country up onto going into office and government putting together GTT report, someone you praised of being professional doing a good work, suddenly now investigating the office of the president, things go radically south. What changed from the time when you celebrated her work to the time when she is now the problem? Are you suggesting that somebody cannot do good one day and do bad another day? No, I'm suggesting that I ask the questions. How you so choose she, to answer them is entirely on So, So she made, she did good work then, and she did bad work later, and she was taking responsibility and accountability. We don't say, oh, because you were good here, you can't take responsibility and accountability here. That's, that's not, uh, it doesn't add up. But for her, she wasn't being investigated because she um, uh, investigated she, because she wrote a report on the office of the president. She been doing. She was investigated because the processes she used were flawed and because she did stuff that was wrong. Here's an example of what was wrong. She independently changed the report that was submitted to her as draft. Nobody does that. That's, that's gross uh, violation of her ethics. According to what standards? Oh, it's just every audit standard. If your auditors who went to the field write a draft report and they give it to you. But Your you, job Chief is not Minister, to edit it you are and not an accountant. It. But those who are professional accountants just list their own report saying, <laughs> as per their investigation, have you also seen they found that, no professional have you misconduct. Also seen that so, members, whose word should the people take? The professional accountants or people like you who are not accountants and uh, probably do not fully understand the work of an accountant and the process. The good thing about governance and leadership is we're advised that people who understand accounting as well. So I'm advised very well by people who understand accounting. I don't even want to go to the hearsay that the person who signed the letter is her cousin or that this is a subset of ICASEL that's not the full ICASEL who did this or that there are still members of ICASEL who have come and said this is, vi violate, this is not 
uh, correct. But Icasa <coughs> was part of the process that interviewed her. Icasa was there. If Icasa was there and they gave evidence and they contributed, uh, you were part of the game. The game ended. And then you come and say, oh, I want to look so good. I want to be, because some of us feel like we side with this person. I don't even have an opinion on this because it's in parliament. Yeah, judgment. But I'm just reacting to, I find it very hypocritical that a, some small subset of this institution that was part of the process can now come and say, oh, we want to save her professional career. It seems like when you redefine really details of the letter, they're after her professional career so that she can practice again. It's not about whether what she did was Abu wrong. Abu Fwamban was here representing six organizations, which include Sludge, 5050, and others. Okay. And he was saying that um, he personally followed. They were present. They had a representative every day throughout the tribunal. And he said that the, the, the testimony from the professional body was that, even during the tribunal, was that there was no professional wrongdoing as per their ethics. Because they want to save her professional career. Because they fit, she's a member of them. And because they, that's their opinion. There were people, a committee that was set up that disagreed with them. Why should we trust, uh, uh, why, why uh, they're not the gold standard of ethics in this case. They're an institutional body. By the way, this body, it's subvented by government. The government pays for ICASO every year. Chief, Chief Minister. So given that we pay for this institution to function, we are not trying to discredit them or undermine them, but that doesn't mean that w w everything that they do is right. On another note, Oh, we have to agree with them. On another note, Chief Minister, are you so far pleased with the contributions of the main opposition APC in the um, I think in, 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 in general governance. Governance generally. Look, I think I'm happy that the APC is participating in government. I think it's a fantastic thing. I, we have all the, there are many APC councils that are doing really, really well. I was in McKinney with the mayor of APC uh, council. Um, he's a great guy, fantastic guy. Um, there's lots of development that's happening, and there are other many districts that are APC control councils that where there's developments that's happening. The APC MPs are participating and contributing. We just saw the the first ladies um, in the, the the bill that she led uh, championed the prohibition of early child marriage. It was people from APC and SLPP co-led that. We've also seen. MCC unanimously approved in, um, in Parliament. So the APC is doing its part in governance, and we're very pleased with, um, with that. We'll take some few messages on our Facebook page because it seemed very tense there. What's, up with, your, what's up with your phone? <laughs> Edsa has not been very nice to me, so my battery just died. I'll see the need to connect, to, to, to connect you for my line because I think we can start very close. But nonetheless, first from my end is from... Um, Creo Bobo says politically motivated cases should have been clearly defined. Um, Lord Gikma says long live the chief minister. Joseph um, Gandhi says the radical inclusion mystic is blowing everywhere. Um, Mosdi says, uh, Mosdi is talking about the US elections, and again Bakari says the American election has um, results. There is a problem with disaggregated results. Or any tripartite agreement, Mohamed Kone should move, should have been present in the election. I think the person was responding to. Um, this one is from Mohamed Moses Conte, who says in Sierra Leone, the idea of inclusion and democracy has been shaped by the country's complex history, particularly its pre colonial struggles, civil war, and ongoing efforts to rebuild and foster a peaceful society. Inclusion and, and democracy are not just political ideas but essential tools for maintaining peace, promoting development, and ensuring that all citizens have a say in the country's future. Historical background and, de democracy and democratic development, Sireland gained independence from Britain in 1961 and initially adopted a multi-party democratic system. However, the political landscape soon became unstable and um, with periods of military rule and one-party democracy. Especially under Sheikh Stevens' rule, the civil war from 1991 to 2002 highlighted the need for an inclusive system 
where marginalized groups, especially youth and rural communities, have a voice. The post-war rebuilding process brought renewed focus on democracy, human rights, and inclusion as a vital to peace. Well, um, the last line of it reads conclusively, in inclusion and democracy in Sierra Leone. Uh, ongoing process requiring political will, societal commitment, and collect collaborative efforts. By fostering a genuine inclusive society, Sierra Leone can move towards a more stable, equitable, and pros prosperous future where democracy is more than just a formality, but a lived reality for all citizens of the country. We have a lot of messages. It sounds like these are people who are wanting a radical inclusion movement <laughs> because these ideas are actually real and these ideas that they are speaking about for uh, vital for peace and it's not democracy requires inclusion. And for me, when I think about radical inclusion, when I launched my book over a year ago, um, then that's when we launched the radical inclusion movement. It's a movement for a more just society. It's a movement that means that anybody, as that person said, the youth, those who are most marginalized, those who are in the extreme, we can account for them. And as a government, we've been practicing that. We've built eight bridges, just four finished, and we'll do another four, in places where bridges never uh, existed. And those bridges are to connect people who are in the hard to reach areas. We've built hospitals in hardest to reach areas and building roads. Feeder roads, 200 kilometers of feeder roads. We'll add another 400 kilometers of feeder roads, which means all those women who were uh, farming in those areas can now bring their farm, their, their products to the produce to the road and have access to the economy. The Giwi Bill, we've seen that it's not just that we passed the Giwi Bill, we've had regulations for the Giwi Bill the prohibition of early marriage. All of these things are radically inclusive things to do. And more recently, some of the things that the movement has been doing is to work with communities to free people who are in prison because they're poor. These are people who stole, by the way, and this led to a lot of misunderstanding and misrepresentation. There are people who are in prison because they cannot pay a fine. The judge says, you're guilty for stealing a goat. You're guilty for doing something you pay two million or you serve one year in prison. If you're wealthy, you can pay the two million, you walk away. You're still guilty. It doesn't say you're not guilty. But if you're poor, you go to prison and you're there. Those are the people who are saying it's not right for the states to be spending all these monies, for them to lose their children's time, for them to lose their economic contribution because they're poor. We're giving them a chance. The worst is there are people who are sentenced to, you do two years and you pay two million. There are people who do those two years, they don't have the two million, they are there for another five, six years. So for your poverty, even though you've served your term, you cannot be free, even though you're allowed to work because you, you couldn't pay your fine. And those people as well, we find it that it's unjust. And as me, as somebody and, and people who have seen that that's not the right thing to do for our community, we can't speak about security and economic productivity if we're keeping the poor people poor and, and, and perpetually poor. That's what radical inclusion is. And as those people said, it's what uh, democracy is, it's what um, peace is, and it's about the young people, it's about marginalized communities. So. I'm happy that those people share that. Lots of messages, actually. Many commendations. But this one from Mystic says, national unity is vital, irrespective of our different political beliefs and affiliations. We must uphold peace in areas of national unity. The agreement is explanatory. I think the current government should go by the agreement to ensure fair play and national cohesion. Um, will. <laughs> um, Lastly, from I my think we'll take Chief Minister, the last. there's been quite some issues here and there on social media about uh, the Chief Minister vying for the presidency. Are you on that path? Are you vying for the presidency to succeed your boss? The one thing that I think about every day when I sleep and wake up is how to support my boss to deliver for the people of this country. When I wake up in the morning and I go to work at, yesterday I was at work at uh, 8, and I did not leave until 8.15. It was to make sure that we deliver for His Excellency the President of the Republic of Sierra Leone, Dr. Julius Malabiu, on the Big Five. That's what I think about from morning to night. And what's your relationship currently with 
the First Lady of the Republic of Sierra Leone. The First Lady, let me say this, is an amazing, fantastic human. She and I have walked from uh, uh, Yee Building, side by side, all the way to Lumley. She and I have traveled this country everywhere. We eat together. We, we hands of our girls, we did it together. Radical inclusion, we, she's been a champion of radical inclusion. She's an amazing person for women, for children, for education. When we, were, when we worked, uh, when I was the Minister of Education, we have a good, respectful relationship with each other. That is not going to change. I think some people like to think that they control the relationship between other people. Um, we live in a country and in a world where it's easy for people to come and put a divide. Oh, this person said this and this one said this. It means there must be enemies. Um, I don't really have enemies. I think she's a fantastic human. I think she's done a lot for this country. Uh, most recently, the prohibition of, um, of, of early marriage. And I respect that. And I think people show respect that and give her her due for what she's doing, the work she's doing at 34. I follow and support her very closely. She's an amazing human. And the Mamikos Festival and Fiesta <laughs> between some of your supporters, as alleged by Dr. Sylvia Olainka Blyden, and your relationship with her. I don't really want to engage um, with her on that substance because of the value and respect I have for elders and for women and for my own mother. Um, because when people, I have never, like me personally, I know even Sabi me mami kona mi mot. It's not possible. If I open my mouth, it won't happen. Um, and I will tell you, the number of times, different people, I don't know, random people, say that for, allow me, make her go and do that. I say no. And if, if, first of all, if you ask me, the minute you ask me, I either ignore you or I say no. So I don't uh, ascribe to the politics of, I think there's been lots of bad politics in this country before. President Bill is showing us that you can have good politics. I'm a politician and I believe in good politics. And good politics means doing the right thing for the people and engaging with the, with, with the people. So I will never respond to anybody who abuses my mother or anybody else's mother. Never. I will never respond to them. And I will never tell anybody to abuse anybody else's mother. And I think it is wrong and it should not be accepted by anybody. And what people don't understand is that there is the law, there is a cyberbullying law, there is a defamation law. And if you think somebody has defamed you and cyberbullied you, go to the police and go to court. Um, we should do that and people should take responsibility for their actions and be accountable i will never send anybody anybody who does that in my name should not do it because it's not me but i don't control those people i don't know them i don't know i don't know people um and i think they feel like they're doing the whatever they feel that they're doing let's go to, let's use the law i believe in the law i believe in justice radical inclusion is towards a more just society on a very light note, which will be my last bite. Um, are you enjoying your role as a chief minister? <laughs> Firstly, and secondly, are you still a Prince William or now a boss school boy? I am a Prince William. <laughs> a proud, by the way, Matt, so this is important because it's a sore point. I think many people, again, are really dishonest. What I have done for Prince of Wales, there are not many people that have ever done it for Prince of Wales. Historically, not just from setting the bar really high for Prince of Wales. But when I left and I went to study, every year I came, I opened an innovation lab at Prince of Wales. I took Prince William to the US and MIT. I took the former principal of, of, of Prince of Wales out to engage on there. When I came, when Tony Blair came, I brought Tony to Prince of Wales. When I was shooting the movie for uh, Bill Gates, I took it to Prince of Wales. When I came as Chief Innovation Officer, I went to the board of Prince of Wales. I'll go to board meetings there. When there's a school league for Prince of Wales, I go to watch the school league of Prince of Wales. I participate in Prince of Wales. So there is, and I don't want to, there are many reasons for this. In terms of contribution for Prince of Wales, there are not many people who put in their sweat, their money, their relationships to Prince of Wales. But somehow there's this false thing about, oh, we're not like P.O. And I think it's a really dangerous ploy by some people who, I don't know why, 
I don't want to say... Maybe they're jealous. You're uh, loving uh, both schools more now. You are yet to answer the question. You are yet to answer the question. Are you still so a Prince am, William or a Bosco boy? I am a proud, boy? proud Prince William. One crimson all the way through. Um, and... Um, uh, and Bose School, I am really honored, and I think it's such an amazing honor. All of my family went to Bose School. I didn't get to go to Bose School, and it's a great distinction for the, the, the great Bose School to consider me uh, a member and give me a number. And I'm really, really honored um, with that, and I think it's a wonderful thing. So, so I'm a see? proud Bose School boy. And a great Prince William. So he's cheating on Prince of Wales. I, 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 I just don't. Leading I, them I, to be I, jealous. I just don't get this one. Ah, I see. I, so. I just don't get it. But again, <laughs> are you enjoying your role as a chief minister? I, I love being a chief minister. I think what I have got, I have always served my country from a young boy to now a big man. Um, but what the chief minister role has done for me. Um, thanks to His Excellency and the rest of the government, is it's allowed me to be closer to the people. It's allowed me to understand what the people want and how I can address it. In the past, I knew what the people wanted, but I didn't have all the power to address it. But with the small power that I have, I can listen to somebody tell me I don't have light and I have the power to solve it, not just for that person, but for the community. What is difficult, on any given day, I receive 500, 600 direct messages. I have a really bad habit of getting to zero, so I read all messages. I respond to a third, a fourth. Um, all those that I don't respond to then feel like, oh, you don't respond to me, and they know I respond to other people, and I'm sorry. I just cannot physically and humanly respond to everybody. And in most of those, 20, 30 percent of them is help me pay my school fee, help my child pay school fee. I pay for those that I can. A percentage, two percent, every day for people. So if I don't get to your own school fee, I plead. I just cannot get to your own school fee, but I've gotten. So it's difficult for me because I am a, I, like, I'm a good person and I want to respond to everybody. I want to pay everybody's school fees. I want to, but I can't. Final example about why I really love this. Um, there's a blind student, Amidu. He wrote me a letter. Lots of people write me letters from everywhere, and I respond. Amidu wrote me a letter. He's the first blind student um, to get admitted to law school in Unimac. He went to Prince of Wales, so he did pull on my emotional Prince of Wales strings. Um, he went to Unimac, got a first class honors and he applied to law school. He's the first blind student to be admitted to law school. Sure. And he wants to be a first blind practicing lawyer. He sent me a letter. Um, I was away. I didn't get it. Augustine, one of my friends, Augustine Sanko, also Prince William, I, I know Sanko. sends me the message on WhatsApp. Say, did you see this? I didn't see it, but then I saw it and I read it. And I s originally, he needed help to pay for his school fees and, uh, and other challenges. So I asked him, okay, what does he need? And then he tells me what he needs. Next day, this boy is in my office. I didn't know people, he's in my office. He sits down, my name is Amidu. I have all of these challenges. I'm struggling at the law school, welfare, this, that, that. Um, I helped him where I can help him. So this is a plea to those who are watching for Amidu. He needs a MacBook Pro so he can be a lawyer, he can practice. And I, I think his story is just amazing. And while I will talk to other people in private sector to help, those who are helping go to law school, but how I can help him as chief minister, there are institutional things that need to happen for him. So is that okay? Have you spoken to your head of law school? I will talk to the head of law school. What are the changes that are necessary for somebody like Hamidou? So that when he's taking an exam, it's different from other people. You're right. And, and those changes need to be done. And we've done it before. When I was at MBSSC as minister, children write exam in Braille now. They never did before. The number of people who are transitioning with kids with disabilities over 1,800 percent the last time that we, we measured it. So I love being chief minister because you can do good.
Thank you so very much. Thank you. Um, Chief Minister David Moyen and it's been a pleasure having you on the show this morning. Thank you. And we're both proud Prince Williams, even if I am also both school. Uh, you're still making them jealous. Come on. I shouldn't say that. That's what you're saying. You're making them jealous. I shouldn't say that. I you, wouldn't you, say that. You've missed, I'm a proud you, Prince you, No, you, you've made the situation worse this morning, <laughs> <laughs> by the way. But nonetheless, thank you so very much. We go for a short break. We'll be right back. This is to wake up soon.